Greetings across whatever you listen to podcasts on. This is the Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell. It's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of someone as they prepare for, perform, and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent films. I'm Ben Modell. I'm a silent film accompanist, composer, etc., etc. This is our episode 61, and we're recording during December of 2023. I'm joined, as always, by my friend, co-producer, and co-host, Kerr Lockhart. How are you, Kerr? Hey, Ben. As we're recording, it's the beginning of the holiday season. So, happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays to all of you who observe or celebrate or notice. For in the silent film racket, things seem to be taper off a little bit for the holidays. Hey, yeah, mm. well, the whole idea of having a, uh, a holiday genre of film did not exist in the silent era. I mean, right. Very, there's almost none. Well, there's like two shorts that I know of. There Ain't No Santa Claus with Charlie Chase and Big Business with Laurel and Hardy. And the Laurel and Hardy short really isn't about presents and gathering the family together and holding hands and, and all that warm and fuzzy stuff. It's, it's them and Jimmy Finlayson destroying each other's property. So <laughs> it basically leaves There Ain't No Santa Claus with Charlie Chase, which is very hard to uh, see in uh, quality print. And now, of course, Hallmark has its own channel for the holiday movies, and, and there are networks that will run National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation for 24 hours. I find myself uh, in a a month like I have this month where I have basically one show a week. And and that is typical unless every once in a while there's a series that that runs at MoMA and I'll be awfully busy in in a December. And sometimes those get those happen right before, right after the holidays. Uh, But then I I use that time to put away my toys and sift through (laughs) things and reflect and, you know, just nest a little spiritually and mentally uh, as we wind the year down. Uh, toward the toward the holidays, I I did get to play at a, a show yesterday, which was the 29th of November, and I got did get to play a, a quite a bit at, at at MoMA in November, and that's our opening theme rendition that you've just heard was recorded in MoMA's Titus One Theater. The sound quality is not ideal. I recorded it hastily; I just took my phone out and and recorded, but it is recorded in Titus One. That's the big original theater. And the instrument in there is a Steinway M, but it's it's got a nice, big, rich sound. And I had some time before a show I played earlier in November, and I thought, ah, so I recorded the theme in there. That piano, by the way, was a donation by Robert Menschel, whose name you see on walls in galleries at MoMA. We were glad to get it because for many years, the piano that sat in Titus One Auditorium was a nice it was a nice Steinway, but the action needed a lot of work. I remember talking with Stuart Oderman and, and we were comparing notes and I said, Does it hurt your hands afterwards? <laughs> he said, Yes. Part of the the challenge of getting it serviced was that it was owned by the architecture department. If you went to silent film shows and sat in the, toward the front and looked at the instrument. This would have been in the 90s and maybe some part of the 2000s. That piano had chrome legs. <laughs> it did oh not have this, It did not have the standard wooden legs, but it had been some architect, somebody had. I don't. Re, I don't know the history on it, but Stuart and I we just referred to it as the chrome leg Steinway. I kept talking to the person in the whatever department it was who would call in the technician to tune and adjust the piano and. At one point, some work had been done on the action, and it got better. If anyone's not familiar, action is all the machinery on a keyboard instrument that intervenes between the artist's finger and you hearing the sound. Uh, yeah, it, it's basically anything that happens from, from you, when you push the key down and a series of Ru- Rube Goldbergian <laughs> contraptions <laughs> inside the instrument precipitate in the whacking of the st- of the strings by a felt hammer. Uh, and so the the touch of a piano and whether it's been regulated, if, which is the term for that. Uh, so it got better. But at one point I came in and, and I was told, oh, there's a new piano coming in. Would you like to come and check it out? So that's the history on, on, the, on that piano. <laughs> this instrument has even better sound than the last one did. So we were glad to get the new, the new piano in there. And that's uh, there's no plaque on it letting us know 
where it came from, the way in Titus 2 that the Steinway S piano originally belonged to Blanchett Rockefeller. <laughs> so I remember when that piano was brought in. I forget what instrument was in Titus 2 before that, but it was another upgrade. Piano playing is a bit like baseball. That is, it's entirely, you come in and it's an entirely different instrument. Your game is going to be different. Uh, you know, a yeah. home run in a Wrigley Field is different than a, a home run in Candlestick Park. And it's the same thing on a, on a piano. Yeah, yeah. You can use, you know, somebody else's mitt. But it's not going to be, you know, you're just used to certain things. And, and, and I, did, I did find in playing this show in Titus 1 on that piano that has a different feel and a different sound to it slightly, it, it affected me I, I, in, a, in a good way. And, and it, as it does with every instrument that I play, they, only ha- they all have their own idiosyncrasies and personalities. And, and it's not to say that uh, a nine-foot concert grand is better than an upright, because I've played shows on uprights where I felt the instrument really responded to me. And I could play all mm-hmm. sorts of stuff. And I've played grand pianos from my years tuning in some tech on pianos. I'll be playing a show and thinking, oh, I know how to fix that. <laughs> if I could just stop <laughs> time and pull the action out and regulate uh, the repetition springs just a little bit. I played great uprights, and I played meh grands, <laughs> as, it's true, and vice though, versa. A piano with good sensitive action makes you a more nimble player. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> no, that was the, th- the the piano in Titus II was rebuilt inside and out by Steinway, and the action on it is unbelievably expressive. And there are things I can play on that piano that I can't on any other is a treat and that's always the thing if anybody who plays a digital piano the feel of the keys is a big part of the experience whether you're playing a, an old fender Rhodes or a yamaha modus that was made eight years ago or one that came off the factory line last year it's really remarkable the the technology uh, of uh, simulated p- real piano action in keyboards mm-hmm. um i upgraded my my older y- yamaha keyboard for a newer one uh, which weighs half as much and feels way more like a real instrument mm. than before. And and then the p- the, key- the keyboards that came before my older Yamaha, they weigh 58 pounds. And they still feel when you're playing the keys, ka-thunk, 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 ka-thunk. <laughs> and, it, and it does affect uh, your ability to, the, the flow of your the instinct musically that you have mm-hmm. and having it come out your hands, hearing it, and then going back into your head and on and on. And it's definitely... That definitely makes mu- a difference. It must be really increased when you're improvising, too, because that's going to go to your decision. Am I going to do, I have an idea for a rapid chromatic figure. Do Will this keyboard do it? Yeah, and, and once you find one thing on, oh, I can do the, the piece, this instrument is like this. Oh, I know I can do this kind of a figure or that kind of a figure, or no, I can't. And then there are the things where... Something doesn't work suddenly during a show. Uh, <laughs> this summer, I, play, I played a show, outdoor show in Cambridge of Safety Last. Very good keyboard. About eight minutes into the film, the middle C locked. Mm. And while I was playing, I would go down and play with one hand and jiggle it with my other hand and see if I could <laughs> free whatever you know insect had gotten inside or whatever. After a few times of unsuccessfully freeing that, I thought, okay. I don't have middle C today. <laughs> then that's part of it also. Like, okay, I can't use this note. Or, and, and, and with theater organs, it can be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Where you, you go in and, okay, okay, the tuba rank, there's not enough air going through or something. I'm not a, a tech person with, with theater organs, but you know, okay, maybe I won't use this. Or the celest rank, oh, uh, every other note doesn't really play. So I won't be using <laughs> that effect or this or that. And you learn to make it make it work. It's a part of the process, is the responsiveness and the sound of the instrument. So we finally settled on a permanent theme for the podcast after 11, yeah. year, after 11 years. And yeah. uh, so now we are uh, looking to arrive at the definitive recording, but I think it's fun. We're hearing, we're going to have variant versions in nearly every episode since we adopted it. Yeah, <clears throat> because I don't have the mental focus to sit down and block out a couple of hours of time and properly record the score, but maybe that will happen in the next month or so when I don't have quite so many shows. But in the meantime, I'm having fun when there's time to record a new edition at a, a gig uh, on mm-hmm. a different instrument as a way of uh, also showing off uh, ad- ad- all the different places I get to play at, and, and the instruments.
So first up, we have a film that may be familiar to a fair number of our listeners. I guess the most popular feature film of the entire silent era, The Big Parade. Yeah, I got to play for this film at the Elmont Library out on Long Island, which was introduced by Philip Harwood, who lives out uh, on Long Island, and he's, in a li- he's a librarian at the Elmont Library, and he's, he's spent the last several years or more finding libraries and other venues, uh, especially out on Long Island, to present classic film that he introduced, and he's also managed to find libraries that have budgets to have uh, a show like that and also have live accompaniment for silent films, so once a- or twice a year, I'll go out to a place like that or the Hewlett Woodmere Library and stuff like that. All three recording samples on today's episode show themes that I was able to create during a show, and often that's the case. I rely on my ability to create a melody and then try to remember it (laughs) the next (laughs) time I need it. One of the things that I was reminded of when I played for the big parade is the sequence when John Gilbert and his two buddies and the rest of the troops march through the forest. And one of the things I remember reading about it in a couple of places is that when they filmed it, they had somebody on a bass drum banging out a beat for the march as they walked in this the, these series of tracking shots through the forest and are one bit by bit picked off by the enemy. And I'm playing for the film, and I remembered, oh, yeah, there's the thing about the bass drum. And so I started playing on a beat. And also, they're marching forward all together, and you figure, you know, you want to do that. And then I discovered, (laughs) as they would cut from one shot to another, that the tempo kept changing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like the person playing the bass drum uh, had a metronome next to them. It didn't look like it was a matter of cranking speed, but I think that... I don't know. I don't have a time machine to go back in time and see what they were doing on set. From watching the clips, while I'm playing, I was looking to see, oh, is this because they're changing cranking speeds? And that was not it either. So I realized that I could not underscore that sequence by keeping a steady beat or Mm. trying to match what I was seeing on screen. It was an interesting challenge. Because I figure no matter what I do, I'm not going to match the tempo <laughs> of the, mm-hmm. the soldiers. And if I do match it, uh, the audience is aware that I'm matching it. But when it cuts to another shot that's going at a different tempo, I don't want to try to match that shot and then match it when they cut again. And then is the audience going to be aware of it? It's an interesting challenge with a sequence like that where you would think, especially with the story about the bass drum, that it would absolutely match. I remember Lee Irwin telling me something he noticed about Keaton shorts or Keaton films is that if you see people marching and there's a cut, he said, you can keep a steady beat and, mm-hmm. and it'll, it'll match from one shot to the next. The thing is to probably do is to completely ignore Mm -hmm. trying to match a beat and and, uh, settle into the the tension and anxiety of what's going on. I noticed you Um, were literally doing the stop and go with the theme, the way we talked about quite a while back on the modern time sequence where he is appraising the art. Um, right. Well, you're 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 <laughs> talking about the the clip we're about to hear, which is not from the the march through the woods. Right. The recording we're about to hear is a theme that I came up with during the film that I, I managed to bring back every time I needed it, and it wasn't really a main theme. I did come up with a love theme for Rene Adderay and, and John Gilbert, and a main theme for the big parade, and plus. There's some existing music that you have to bring around. We're in the army now, and uh, it's the life in the army or something like that. But I came up with this this theme that I used when there were like these charm sequences between mm. Rene Adderay and John Gilbert. When they first meet, he tries to talk, talk to her. She doesn't understand English. He doesn't understand French and points to a frog and is like, oh, you frog, this is a frog also. And she didn't understand. Of course, she, even a contemporary <laughs> audience doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> and then I kind of workshop this sort of charm moment melody. And then the next time it came around, which is what we're about to hear, is the sequence with the chewing gum, mm. which is the real, it's sort of, it's sort of like the meat cute. Uh, of the film, although they've already they actually they've already, they've already had the meet cute. It's a sequence with the the barrel, mm-hmm. but this is the first time that the two of them sit down and have some kind of communication 
uh, with one another where she does kind of understand what he's uh, telling her and vice versa when they're pointing to each other and using a phrase book but is with chewing gum I took great delight in not only being able to repeat the theme I had come up with but playing with this idea of yes it's okay to stop playing Mm -hmm. (laughs) and in the middle of a phrase and just wait and as and I, I always watch for the prep the, the physical preparation before the movement. So a head moves back a little bit, and then a, a breath happens, or a, a point uh, with the finger happens, much like that sequence from City Lights. I got to play with that. So we'll we'll hear that now. This is uh, recorded live in performance at the Elmont Library on a Yamaha upright piano. I've got my Zoom H two N pointed at the back of the piano, so you're here. You may not hear any audience chuckles or anything like that, but that's what you'll hear. And this is the about three minutes from my live performance for the big parade directed by King Vidor, starting with that moment with the chewing gum and go, and then uh, going on. Recorded live in performance at the Elmont Memorial Library in Elmont, New York, which is out on Long Island. Uh, yours truly accompanying a sequence from The Big Parade, directed by King Vidor. It's the sequence that begins with the chewing gum charm moment and goes on uh, after that. Kind of a key the, to why that was the number one film because it's not just a war film. It really the film rests very much on that relationship and the audience buy in to them and wanting them to be together, enjoying them together. Yeah, it's that motif or storytelling device that Griffith really pioneered of taking a love interest and placing it against the backdrop of a historical incident or era, which he does in not only Birth of a Nation, but it's in America and it's in Orphans of the Storm and in, I guess, all all the segments of Intolerance. And we're still doing it with Titanic. Yeah, really, you know, he set the precedent and the mold for Yes, you can do this, and here's how it can work. Mm -hmm. And Big Parade was really the first of the 
big World War One movies that was a huge hit and then, then spawned so many others like What Price Glory and Wings and The Patent Leather Kid and on and on. It's a great film, and there's a very nice Blu-ray with Carl Davis's score on it that, that's available. It was shown at the Elmont Memorial Library the day before Veterans Day, and that was the th- thematic reason for its being programmed there. So we move from a very familiar silent classic. Now we're going going to spend the rest of this episode at the Museum of Modern Art with some very much lesser known films. The first one here on our list is a rare Italian silent shown as part of the Women Film Pioneers Project series, A Santa Notte. This series was a great education for me and definitely for the folks who attended the films. This was being done to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the starting of the Women Film Pioneers Project, which was launched by Jane Gaines at Columbia University and is now also run by Kate Saccone. Uh, who put the series together. It was many films over a a few weeks and many films that you just don't know or just never get shown. And this was a great showcase, an opportunity for films like this one and others to be programmed and screened. If you go to MoMA's website and look for this series, you'll get to see a list of all the films. There's a film by Musidora that she is in and that which she directs and which has been around in a sort of truncated and not good-looking form, but which was restored by the San Francisco Silent Film Festival some years ago, which is way more complete and good-looking, and so that got screened. So it was an opportunity for films like that to be shown. And A Santa Notte, it's an Italian film, and... There is a song that somebody in the film, one of the main characters, sings in a cafe. And they were able to identify it, and Kate Saccone sent me a link to a YouTube uh, upload of of what what that piece was. And I did find it. And I realized that no one is going to know that song. No one is going to know that that's what he's singing. It's not like there's a shot of sheet music or anything. And also, Santa Note is also the name of of a song. So it's another song. That piece, oddly enough, it was written by somebody who I could find sheet music for several of that composer's other works, but not this one. And there are uploads of, of recordings by Mario Lanza and other people, and I thought, well, I could transcribe it. But I also realized the same thing. No one knows this song. It's not like it's O Solo Mia or anything like that. So no one is in, in this year is going to expect to hear that song used, and it doesn't really have that much to do with enough to do with the plot that, you know, it's not like it's Jingle Bells or Pop Goes the Weasel and everybody's going to be expecting, you know, or or Frosty the Snowman that tells a story. So it wasn't super necessary to look it up. And again, when I have, you know, 15 shows in a month where a lot of them are a short and a feature, there's just no way to do that much. There's just no time uh, on top of my other work to, to look up that music, find it, learn it, try to make it work into the film when there's no screener, etc., etc., I wound up creating a piece that I would play when this character, one of the love interests, is singing it. But I also use it as the love theme in two or three other places. And so that way, dramatically, it ties to the moment when he sings in the cafe or sings under the window of of the woman he's in love with. I think that happens. That makes Um, a lot of sense because if it's the theme as I'm recalling it, It was very sweet, and uh, the word I would use is naive sound. It was a very open sound. Yeah, and and I tried to make it, you know, like the rest of the recording you're about to hear, it's it's like playing, I find, for a Russian film. You can't help playing in that kind of a a style, not just both in terms of an Italian sound, but an older sound. Music that fit... The locale and era came out of my hands throughout the show. And even while I was playing, I thought, Jesus, should I should I avoid that? Should I go back to playing my usual thing? But it just it seemed right. I went with that. But there was a, it was a theme. And this is something Lee Irwin taught me is that you memorize the intervals between the notes. So in other words, that means how many keys to the left or right on the keyboard, mm-hmm. if you're looking at it, a sequence of notes is. And I think that, that it's it's similar to the way... I was told uh, by Eric James uh, what Chaplin's music notation system was. He would write first five notes, Beethoven Sonata number eight, 
<laughs> and then next five notes from Mozart, blah, blah, blah. But though he knew that sequence of notes, and that's how he no- wrote the things down. So you, if you can remember, oh, uh, you know, uh, you're going from this note to that note, and it's that distance apart, and then the next two notes or whatever, as well as any n- mnemonic devices that I may come up with, like the rhythm of the n- name of the actor in, who's playing this part. <laughs> It's easier to remember later on. Okay, uh, the love theme goes this, 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 this. So I was able to create this. And, and I think that also dramatically, if nobody is expecting to hear whatever song it is that that's everybody in the audience knows, then I can create one and then I can make it work for moments where the love theme should be heard as well as this moment when this, this gentleman sings to, to, to somebody else. So you'll hear this is recorded in uh, the Titus II Auditorium at the Museum of Modern Art on the piano formerly owned by Blanchett Rockefeller. It's a Steinway S made in 1952. Here's a couple of minutes of my live score for A Santa Notte. Yours truly accompanying a few minutes of A Santa Notte, recorded live in performance at the Titus II Auditorium at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City on a 5 foot 1 inch Steinway S, made in 1952. It struck me listening uh, without seeing the film but I was sensing that you were almost in dialogue with the image or interacting with the image. Yeah, I, I, I think I was. Mm-hmm. And I, this might have been my second time playing for the film because all the films were shown twice. And sometimes I got to play the repeat show and sometimes I didn't. But in this case, I did get to play both screenings. And so I, I kind of knew the film a little bit better and could breathe with it musically a little bit better. And it's also it, the film's performance style was such that it was it, it felt kind of intimate. Mm-hmm. It's a small story with a few characters. There's not tons of action. And I felt like I could hold back and breathe with the movements, not just to make it look like post-score choreography, but to help the the audience of today connect emotionally with what's going on, especially where there is a lot of Delsart-looking gesturing and, and stuff like that. This is a, it's an early teens film, and, and the performance styles are still of that time. So it, it's a way of stylistically helping the film resonate with a contemporary audience. 
Now our uh, next excerpt, your note to me indicates we're bridging two films. How is that yeah. working? Well, this is just, this is something, I, this is the film show that I played a couple days ago where it was a double feature. Before you start thinking, oh my gosh, you were playing for three hours, the program was about two hours long. We got to remember that typical feature length films in the silent era were five, six, seven reels would run around a, a, an hour and the 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 classics cinema file films the film school films that run two hours and 20 minutes or an hour and a half were more the exception just ask any movie theater owner <laughs> who, would, who would say oh god 10 reels oh great now i can only book four or five shows a day but a typical show would be your feature would be five six seven reels and of course there and were, so that's what this was there yeah. were shorts in the program so the entire right, program so be, might be two hours. Well, yeah, it would be 90 minutes or two hours. So you would have a show, 12, 12 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And you have your your feature, your comedy short, and, and, a, and a news weekly. So this was a program that was part of a series that is being done December 2023, as well as the, the end of November, uh, as a tribute to film historian and curator Adrienne Mancha, who was at MoMA for a couple of decades. And I, I did once, I remember playing one series that she curated, ironically tying into our discussion of a few minutes ago. It was a series of Italian diva silence. Mm. But uh, she passed away several years ago, and then there was a, a tribute to her being done and she, like uh, Eileen Bowser or Iris Barry was someone who uh, was a champion of a lot of different films and kinds of films that might not otherwise have been championed and so the, the series runs over several decades of filmmaking the, the evening show I would play for a matinee the evening show that night was a, a Dementia 13 oh my so it's it a wide range of films <laughs> uh, but in, in this case uh, I was playing for a double feature of The Jackknife Man, directed by King Vidor, and a film called The Seventh Day, which was directed by Henry King. So these two films were films that were important to Adrian, and also there are prints at the Museum of Modern Art in 35 millimeters. So these were 35 millimeter prints. The Jackknife Man, is a gr it's a great film. I recall playing for it a number of times early on in my film accompaniment career it's never been released on home video I'm not sure why that is and the seventh day is it's a great film and in both of the films were programmed in a series that charles silver did called an autourist history of film that's why when i was playing for the seventh day which i thought i don't think i know this film even though i have in my notes that i played for it about three or four minutes in i thought oh it's this one <laughs> And it was, and it's a film that you can find it on YouTube with Czech titles, Czech Czech <laughs> language titles. Um, the print that MoMA has has remade uh, back into English titles. That was a project that was must have been done in the eighties or nineties. There are some titles before the film begins indicating that it, this was done not only by the Museum of Modern Art but with assistance from the Northeast Historic Film. And there's a a lot of location footage that I'm assuming was filmed in Maine. So MoMA's edition has titles that they created translated back in, into English. But again, I don't think this film is available on home video at all. Uh, not only is it directed by Henry King, it stars Richard Barthelmus, which is why the credit that they created at the beginning says Inspiration Pictures Presents. And that was his production company. I'm including this re recording snippet just because it, it shows the transi my transitioning between two films. We've talked about this before. Sometimes there are accompanists who wait until the film begins before playing. I don't do that. I keep the, the flow of the, the show going. That's just my way of doing it. I think a lot of theater organists work that way as well. So you're going to hear the end of The Jackknife Man in which you will hear the theme that I created for the young boy. The character name is Buddy, who is a central figure in, in the story of, of the, the Jackknife Man. You'll hear me play the theme I created for Buddy, wrap up the film, and then segue into the next film without, you know, basically, you'll hear my, my formula is like, as the applause is dying down, I start up with, okay, here we go, here comes another movie. 
and then when I see scratches or whatever, or the next film <laughs> begin mm -hmm. on screen, I segue into that. So that's what you're hearing. And again, this is a, a, in Titus 2 at MoMA. Transitioning out of and into two different feature films on the same program, yours truly accompanying the end of The Jackknife Man and the beginning of The Seventh Day at the Museum of Modern Art on a Steinway S piano. I heard something in the Seventh Day score that a lot of silent film accompanists lean on heavily, but Ben Modell uses rather lightly, which is ragtime. Yes, well, that's because there's a sequence where people are dancing. The basic plot of The Seventh Day is that Richard Barthelmus and his, I think, his sister, and they live on this coastal town in Maine. And some young playboys and their lady friends are on a yacht and they're stuck and are brought ashore. And Barthelmus falls in love with somebody from the boat culture and vice versa and all this stuff happens. So there is an extended sequence on the boat at the beginning of the film where some, there is a gramophone uh, or a Victrola on deck and there you see they're playing it and uh, they're dancing around. And I remember when I saw this and they're cranking up the Victrola and I thought, oh hell please <laughs> please don't show the label please, i hope don't know please i do, oh gosh i hope i know what the hell this is or that it's so obscure no one will know and he just put the record on it wasn't about the, i thought thank goodness and i could create something but i knew that this is a film made in 1920 so i couldn't swing too much because uh even foxtrot uh stuff from the late 20s uh, has a different sound to it than what pop music sounded like in 1920. So I, I tried to play something, well, not necessarily ra somewhere between ragtime, but but oh, definitely uh, a one step. No, yeah, yeah, exactly a one step feel that you would you might hear in popular music mm -hmm. in 1920. So that's that's what what you're hearing. But you're absolutely right. And that's something I noticed when I worked on the book that I wrote and edited called The Music of the Silent Films, was published by Music Sales several years ago, which is that in going through several huge collections of mood cues, of photoplay music, that you would find everything, hymns, pop tunes, marches, gobs and gobs of mood cues. But the one thing I absolutely never found was ragtime. Mm. There are people who play Ragtime for Silence. My own personal feeling about it is that si silent, especially with comedies, Ragtime sounds like what silent comedies look like. <laughs> and that to have the two things on top, it's too much. Mm -hmm. And especially because it's music that's meant to be listened to. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just that's just my, my own personal taste. But when it's called for... sure. Sure, but from the, the, the collection I had that was about 350 pieces to one that's at the Balaban and Katz Theater collection at a, at a library in Chicago and to several others, that was the one thing. I, you, you can't find music for Maple Leaf Rag. Pine, I mean, the, all the tunes you hear on YouTube, <laughs> you know, Pineapple Rag and, and, and uh, Magnetic Rag and uh, Wolverine Blues, 
uh, by Jelly Roll Morton. It's like the same four cuts. You you don't see you know any of the the items from the Redback book that you know the going through sugar well, resuscitated in the seventies. You just don't. We've talked about the drawbacks of using pre existing music, but I would also think that even if you're creating and you're improvising a strophic melody that tends to group itself into eight or 16 bar phrases, now you're locked in. Like if you're going to need to turn, you're, yeah, you'll turn, you'll go, but you're going to leave the audience unsatisfied uh, yeah. by busting it's, the it's melody just, up. <clears throat> yes. And now, now for an idiot like me, what is a strophic? Well, that's what is strophic mean? That means <laughs> that phrases are repeated. So the conventional oh. structure of an American popular song is 32 bars, A, A, B, A. So yeah. that the first, second, and fourth set of eight is functionally the same. The notes at yeah. the end will be different because they want to resolve or move ahead in different ways. But you do the same thing. And then you have the middle part of musicians called the bridge, uh, which is contrasting. It's, it's very locked. Yeah. It's odd. And, and- it's odd that when you hear the, the, the Vitaphone early synchronized soundtracks for the last year or two of the silent era that they seem to think nothing of just kind of doing a what we would call today a needle drop and just have a song oh. play from beginning to end yeah and a lot of those those scores are are like that not not only those but if you listen to anything that that's been done by the Montalto Motion Picture Orchestra cuz they're playing those mood cues i mean it's different from pop tunes which is what i think you're talking about mm-hmm. especially the MGM ones where they're plugging their song library yeah. or anything especially from Warner Brothers they're really pushing their own catalog you know a, a typical compiled score is going to be is going to work that way. I think that uh, the trick, like you're saying, is that with ragtime, it's it's a harder pivot. Mm-hmm. A pivot can be, can definitely be made, but it's it, it's because it's a recognizable style. If you shift out of it suddenly, uh, you've either got to be ready for it, <laughs> so that you do it as soon as they cut to the car plowing through the wall or whatever <laughs> or whatever. Um, it's just a harder pivot, and that and that that is that is a challenge. Any kind of a pivot. I mean, that's something I noticed with Jackknife Man. It was one of those films where, where a scene wouldn't necessarily, in a tidy way, wrap up and fade or iris out. We would just cut to the next title, and so I was able to preview enough of the film for at least the first two reels where I had notes and took mental notes of okay when. When Buddy takes a bite of an apple and embraces the jackknife man, uh, Peter or something, wrap it up. Because mm-hmm. the next thing is going to be something different. And so I was able to musically resolve and move into the next title. A lot of Griffith films are like that. And a lot of, a lot of teen, teens dramas are like that. Where they'll just, they'll just cut to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And they don't fade out. It was the complete opposite of the experience I had scoring Beverly of Graustark, where absolutely every scene had a button mm-hmm. and a fade. Yeah. And then a fade up on a title. And I could, it was so easy to just stop and start for every scene if I needed to. For a film like uh, Jackknife, and which was not the case with Seventh Day, which, which did have more tidy wrap-ups and, uh, and transitions. But with Jackknife Man, had I had more time... I, w- I would have, you know, mapped out the rest of the film so I knew to wrap things up when the guy sits down and looks out the window so it, it would look like I was staying ahead of the film. Yeah, it's interesting to see how the grammar of these devices evolves over time. I'm thinking by, I think it's 1931, uh, an American tragedy. Ordinarily, a, a fade-out, we, we hardly use them at all now. But if we use them, they're going to indicate a passage of time. A substantial passage, um, yeah, and 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 the the fade out is going to be different than say a lap dissolve or a cross fade, yeah. But in in nineteen thirty one, there are fade outs and fade ins that are within the same time and place. It'll be moments later, uh, yeah. Uh, that yeah, you know the that the audience had to keep reading these because the. Yeah, like bringing back the Oxford comma, the punctuation changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was part of the it was part of the language in the silent era, mm-hmm. and that held on uh, even after it was no longer of any use. Mm-hmm. So, but it was definitely part of the language. It's somebody. I mean, it's you know, this is the thing I I, I marvel at 
is that so much of this this language and expressiveness just happened mm-hmm. on the fly while people were churning out films, uh, especially in the early teens. This is something I talk about in the, my book, which will be out at some point next year. But even something like the device of having somebody appear to be thinking about something, then fading out, then fading into what they're thinking about, fading out, and then fading back into that person who was thinking as it indicating to us in the audience, oh, this is what that person is thinking about. There's no title that says he remembers the time his his shoelace was untied. Mm-hmm. It's just look into the distance, fade out, fade in, to sh- untied shoe, fade out, fade in, back to the person. And and so the device of, of neatly wrapping up something and not just cutting to the next thing happens at some point gradually. So and, and, and there, are mid, there are mid-teens, I mean, late teens and early 20s films that do it and, and those that don't. But it's, uh, as an accompanist, I feel tasked with making that work because if the music from the last scene dribbles over into the next title... I would like it to not happen that way. Let's just put it that way. You can do it. I mean, you can do just a, a constant stream and flow of music from you know opening titles to end of real seven, uh, without any kind of pauses. And and it's and it's a lo- way that a lot of us work because the title will just it hits the screen. Oh, I guess we're at a football game now, and you have to quickly pivot or come to a resolution. And then start the football game music just in time for the title to end. <laughs> um, but but you want to look like you're not behind the film, and you want to fit the moment of it. It's just that there are it is a, it is a challenge. There are a lot of films from a certain number of years of, of the silent era where, in some ways, yes, we've we've wrapped up the point or the moment, but there isn't a tidy and you know exhale at the end of it. We just okay. <laughs> and it's a cut to later that year or mm-hmm. 10 years later or, you know, uh, on her deathbed, she declares, you know, d- the ideal thing would be to know what happens four seconds before and make a cue on a sheet. So, you know, oh, when, when he pats his mother on the head, resolve. And that's what I try to do with uh, with when I have the time to, to map things out. I, I, I aim to do that. And the irony is that uh, sharp, brutal cut comes back in the late 50s and early 60s. It's almost well, the only way to move b- between entire sequences. You know, huge yeah. jumps. And, and they said, well, you know, Hollywood had that old corny old fade out and we're not going to do that anymore. And the audiences are bored and we need to get them excited. And so we're just going to we're just going to go to the next thing. Mm. Yeah. And, and now we have the things where... And so we've gone right back to 1916. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah, and, and, and now we're in, in this time when, you know, the, nothing is held on screen for more than 17 frames. Oh, my now. gosh, yes. So walking back to talking about, we mentioned slapstick and jaunty tunes and complete. Mm. Uh, next week, you'll be doing a, a show you've done before. And uh, I'm sure that we'll do many times again, particularly oh, in the next couple of years, which is uh, Laurel and Hardy shorts. So there is a restoration program going on now of those subjects as they enter public domain. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see Laurel and Hardy on screens a lot more than we have been. I would think one of the challenges is unlike many of the things that we've been talking about, Laurel and Hardy carry with them musical expectations. So how do you address that? Well, that's something that comes up in a number of different fronts. First of all, their theme song didn't exist until, I think, 1931. However, because there are so many people in the audience who grew up watching Laurel and Hardy shorts on television and know that song, I feel obligated, much like the way Lee would, Lee Irwin would say to me, when he would play for things like Nosferatu at Halloween time, as the lights were going down, he would play da 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 just to get it out of the way. Mm-hmm. You were expecting to hear it. It's not. I'm not going to use it in the film, but it's, it's you know because the audience is expecting it. And I find when I use the 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 cuckoo song or the March of the Cuckoos, I'll I'll do it if it, on a shorts program. I'll do it once, maybe twice. I might do it. For the opening titles of the first film, again, so that you've heard it. Or if I don't use it at all, I'll use it as the film is wrapping up of the last short. And every time, there's an audible response from the audience of recognition and warmth. Mm -hmm. And so I feel vindicated as much as it's an anachronism. 
just to hear a third of the audience go, oh, yes, this old friend of ours. So I'll, I'll use it sparingly. But uh, I also do know people are expecting Leroy Shields and Marvin Hatley. And I will play something that sounds, you know, at the top of a show like that, I will launch into something that sounds like Leroy Shields' music, uh, but isn't. So it's not like, oh, that's that song. And then and then move out of it. And then the rest of it is just standard, the standard thing that I do, except that what I try, I'm playing with now, and I may, I may not need to do it, or maybe it's too on the nose, but is playing with the rhythms mm-hmm. of Stan and Ollie, because there's always an extra couple of bars that you have to build into a phrase while Stan figures it out. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this moment, you know, it's like that conversation that the two of them have uh, sitting on the sofa in Wrong Again. You know, you don't understand. These are rich people. They do things differently. And then Stan has to think it through. Oh, do you mean like this? Yes. Why, he's taking, he's upstairs taking a bath. It's not even Monday. <laughs> Beat. Beat, beat. Oh, just the reverse. Beat, beat. Yes. So I'll play a phrase like that where bu- 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 bum, da- 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 dum, to and dum, and, and dum, and bum, 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 bum. You know, and it, it, because it feels like the rhythm of, of their relationship. And it, again, may be too on the nose, and it probably works fine if I don't do that. But it's something I'm having fun with right now, and until I either get tired of it or I start getting comments from people that, oh, I, I was very aware of your score then, and it, you know, or in, in a way that it's distracting, uh, I may uh, continue to do that. But that is, and this leads into what I wanna, wanted to wrap up with, was, is that... Uh, Having done this, this practice of the stopping and starting and all this stuff where it looks like I had post scored the film uh, with a click track and everything. And it's something I can do now. I can sight read a film and still make it look like I've written this thing out and timed it down to the second and, and to the half second where I can I can resolve something as a fade out is happening in a film I haven't seen before. Now that I'm, I've gotten used to that, I'm now starting to wonder should I continue? Do I do I continue to develop it? Do I pull back from doing that and try something uh, something else? And you know, this is it's December. It's the end of the year, and I find myself making a pledge to myself and to people who come to my shows or, or buy Blu-rays and DVDs and who listen to this podcast to do better with my music. Especially, I feel right now this is something I want to try to put my attention. Even even more than I may have this past year, I always resolve to do that. Um, sometimes somebody will come up to me at a show they haven't heard me in a while, and, they, and they'll say, "Boy, you know, you sound different," which is which is good. But I always think of, and I post this on Facebook usually at the end of the year, when Akira Kurosawa was given his lifetime Oscar. Kur, I don't know if you remember this, but I, but this his acceptance speech, he basically says. Remember, this is, you know, he's in his 80s and it's a lifetime achievement. He says, I do not know that I understand cinema yet. And I will continue to make movies and do better so that I can grasp what cinema really is. (laughs) So I figure if Kurosawa can get up after making 50 years of movies or whatever it is and think, well... I still have a lot to learn. I, I, I feel the same way. Mm-hmm. I listen to my recordings and as a anybody who creates anything, you're you're you only hear the, the clams and the mistakes and uh and, and, all, and all sorts of th- things like that. But it is it is something I wanna get better at. Um uh I wanna see if I, there isn't something I can improve on in my playing in, in just in terms of technically uh, in terms of the keys I don't find my hands in, and in, in terms of just how I score and underscore things. Uh, I want to continue to 
experiment and play with uh, the holding back, not playing like it sounds like I'm being paid by the eighth note. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you hear just a, this this constant cascade of notes just to give it some more air. These are things I'm going to try and play with, and I may fall on my face at shows, uh, and I may have triumphs. And, 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 you know, if you listen to this this podcast, and, and even if you don't, I, I want to be clear that I'm not sharing these uh, ideas about how to accompany films as th- this is how to do it, and and things that I always do at every show. Uh, there are things that I strive for. These are things that I believe in but i'm it's constantly evolving and uh, you may disagree with some of these uh, principles and you may think they're fantastic but i i'm not putting myself on a pedestal i'm sharing what i uh what i i've learned what i've experienced what i know and uh will continue to you know grow in terms of uh how i treat uh, underscoring a silent film so that these films can develop a new audience uh, so that it 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 uh it continues on not just for folks my and Kerr's age but for the folks half our age who are discovering and being smitten with uh silent film today a truly admirable goal and attitude i'm, I'm impressed well thank you well well <laughs> well, well thank you and, and i want to thank you Kerr. uh we did we this is our seventh episode this year um, which is about six more than I usually got out before you came on uh, and helped with the podcast. And uh, we aim, of course, to do something every month. And we both have lives, as do everybody. Uh, and uh, sometimes we'll, we'll miss a month. But uh, we're keeping it consistent, and that's really about 99 to 108% you. Keeping it regular, getting the things uh, recorded, edited, and I want to thank you, Kerr, for for your camaraderie and and your producing on the show. Thanks very much. It is a it is a pleasure. Sometimes, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot like doing. I don't know. I don't do crochet, but it, <laughs> if it, it it's something like that, it's a lot of dealing with little bits of things um, <laughs> for long periods of time. I, I literally, uh, my eyes go out of focus um, after a mm-hmm. few hours. Um, yeah, <laughs> but but yeah. I um, I I have to say I'm very uh, fond of the final results. Um, I think we're getting better at making a uh, uh, a show that moves along and is uh, fun to listen to. As fun as it is for us to make it. Because, folks, you yes, be glad you don't hear all of it because we sit and yak. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, Forever. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to thank anybody who has come up to me at a show and told me how much you've enjoyed the podcast. I encourage you, the listener, to do so or to write to me. It's always nice to hear how it's going going on out, out there for you. And uh, we want to thank you for listening for for sharing sharing uh, uh, links to people, uh, the the podcast is now available on YouTube as well as many many other other platforms. And so, if you post comments there, and as Kerr says uh, on the end of our episode, put a, a, a review and a rating, not to pat us on the back, but that gooses the algorithm to get it shared with people who might be looking for something like this in the in the in the realm of people who listen to this also might like this. And if you want to stay up and current with uh, where Ben can be heard in person, go to silentfilmmusic.com and sign up for the email newsletter. That is the most reliable source of information. Absolutely. And thanks thanks so much. This has been the Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell, episode 61 in December of 2023. It's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of someone as they prepare for, perform, and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent films. I'm Ben Modell. I'm a silent film accompanist, historian, presenter, and home video label, among other things, uh, joined as always by co-producer and co-host Kerr Lockhart. Thanks so much for listening to the Silent Film Music Podcast. Happy holidays, happy new year, And I'll see you at the silence.